Well, we are looking, of course, at 1 Thessalonians now in our sermon series. We're at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'll read that to you in just a moment. We're, we're continuing this uh, sermon series. This is now our third sermon on it. And uh, we have seen already how Paul thanked God for Thessalonians that were in God and in Christ Jesus the Lord. God the Father in Christ Jesus the Lord. And we talked about how whenever as we're traveling around or as we meet people and we learn of a church over here or a church over there, just the very idea that there are people who are lost, condemned sinners that are now brought together and calling upon the name of the Lord should bring forth thanksgiving from deep within us. And that thanksgiving should not just be something we feel in our heart, but something we express to God. Paul said, I thank God. He didn't just say, I feel thankful. He actually thanked God for this church at Thessalonica that was made up of these people. There were, there were idol worshipers, many of them, and they turned from idols to serve the living God. It's a marvelous thing that there are sinners, that we're all from, from our roots in Adam, we're all sinners, and yet God has provided salvation so that there are people that are now in God, the Father, and in Christ Jesus the Lord. We also saw that there is an additional reason for Paul to be thankful for this church. And that was because they were a model church. They stood out as an example of what a church ought to be above other churches at this time. Other churches were talking about them and they were looking at them because here were people that had great opposition, great conflict when the gospel was preached there and they came to the Lord with zeal. It did not hold them back. They received the word of God with much affliction. And we talked about how as the apostles lived before them, bearing that affliction, then they imitated them in the Lord Jesus, bearing affliction. And they then came and gladly bore that affliction in serving the Lord because they had now salvation in Christ Jesus. And we saw how that because of that, then the other, nation, the, the other uh, churches in, Mas in Mesopotamia were, were looking at what they had done. In Macedonia and in Achaia, I should say, that they were looking at, uh, at these Thessalonians as a model. And the word even went out beyond that. And we talked about how when we receive the word, then we should become a model church to other churches, an example that would be worthy of following now this week we have another model presented to us, and this time it's a model of ministry. And so, you remember last week we had to do some repenting as we saw what a model church ought to be? Well this week in preparing this message especially, I had to do a lot of repenting because this is a very challenging message to, to ministers of the gospel and particularly, and by the way it's 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through 12 that we're looking at. Now it stings to have models like we saw last week and like we see again this week because we come short. But you know, think about that. What good is a model if it is not better than you? you don't have, it's not a model to you. A model is supposed to be better than you. And then you have something to aspire to, something by God's grace to aim for that you would become like that model. We always have a model that is far, far above us in this life, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. We also have many other models of faithful brothers and sisters and churches that also in the same way are examples to us that we can learn from and follow. So as long as we walk in this world, we're always going to have models like this that, that we can look to. And let me add that in preaching about this model of ministry, I'm mindful of the fact that this isn't a pastor's conference. So you're not all ministers of the gospel here. We actually do have one minister of the gospel here today that I know of. But um, we need to, as you hear this, it should stir up prayer for you that your minister would be like this, whatever church you're from, that your minister would be conformed to this mo model. Ministers love for people to pray for them because it's a very challenging thing to be a minister of the gospel. We will incur a stricter judgment. And we need your prayers. And you should desire for us to be all that we should be so that we will bring ministry to you that the Lord Jesus wants us to bring to you. 
And besides that, in preaching this, I'm also going to apply it to you directly because all of you are ministers in various ways. Maybe you're the head of your home and you have the responsibility of ministering to your family. So though everything that pertains to a minister of the word does not apply to you, there are many things that apply very much to you. I'll be talking about those things. Or maybe you're just a, a kid in your home. Well, you have peers, you have friends, you have your, your brothers and sisters in your home, and you are also to be ministering to them. You're to look to have an influence for eternal good in the lives of those around you. And of course, there are some who are officers in the church that are also among us, and they particularly have a ministry to others. So please uh, give careful attention to what we're looking at today, and now give careful attention as I read to you from the Holy Word of God, recognizing that these are God's words that he has given to us as his people, so we receive them with, with reverence and with joy that God should speak to us. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and beginning in verse 1, the Word of God. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. For laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly, and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And there we'll end the reading of God's holy word. May he bless the word to us that we have heard read, and now as we hear it expounded to us. Notice how this passage begins. Paul declares his ministry among the Thessalonians was not in vain. And, it did, and indeed, it wasn't. That tells us the first thing about a godly ministry, that it is not in vain. Godly ministry is not exercised in vain. What, a, what an awful thought that is for, for ministry to be in vain. Something when it is done in vain, is worthless. It's a pure waste. It's a waste of time. There are two possible ways that ministry could be said to be in vain. One is, is that the ministry itself was faithful, but it produced no fruit. So it was in vain in that way. Paul sometimes is concerned that he may have labored in vain among people because they've turned to another gospel, for example, as he says to the Galatians. The other is that the ministry itself was worthless that it failed because it was an unfaithful, ungodly ministry. It didn't produce any fruit because it was a vain ministry to start with. In the first case, it would be like a farmer who plants a field, and when the harvest day comes, he has nothing to show for it. He was faithful in his labors, but there's nothing but barren ground. The labor was expended in vain. He may have done all that he could reasonably have done, but perhaps his crop was destroyed by a hailstorm or, or, or something other that came along like that. And of course, in a sense, Paul says in another place that we never labor in vain if we're faithfully laboring in the ministry. But in this sense, it is in vain that there was no fruit. 
So you see, we're still bringing glory to God even if no one believes. But it is in vain in that there was no fruit. In the second case, it is that this, his farming itself is vain and worthless. Maybe he slept in when it was the time for plowing and he got his crops in late. And then when they needed watering and they needed fertilizing, he did not get out and do the necessary work. So the crop failed. But Paul appeals to the Thessalonians to consider the ministry that he had among them. That it was not in vain in either of these ways. They know that it wasn't in vain because, as we just saw in chapter 1, they had become a model church. And he's tying into that. He says, for our ministry was not in vain. And, and Paul is going on to explain another reason that it wasn't in vain, not just because of what God had done in their life in responding, but also because the ministry itself was not in vain. It was not done in a wrong way. It was a ministry that was done in a way that was pleasing to God. Now, something that Paul feels in Thessalonians a need to defend his ministry to them because he was being criticized, maybe for leaving so quickly. And of course, that's a plausible theory. But the thing is, is he never says a word about people opposing him in this way. People opposed him, for sure. They opposed the gospel. But people in the church that had risen up and maybe were starting to uh, murmur complaints and things like that. He had that in Corinth. And he specifies specifically that there are some who are saying this, and I'm saying this in response to that. And he's, he goes head to head with them. But here's nothing about it. So I think it is better that I agree with those who would say that Paul is here giving a model. It's a teaching for us of what a ministry is supposed to look like. He's seeing the Thessalonian church. They're starting to go out. They're sending missionaries out. They have ministers among them. And he's saying, I want to set before these people what ministry is supposed to look like. And so he's presenting his own example. What better way? He was there living it before their eyes with, with Timothy and with Silas. And so now he's saying, I want you to, to see what we did. I want you to remember what we did because this is what you need to do. And whether, whatever the case with the different theories about how it came, the, the truth is, is what we have here from the Holy Spirit in this passage is something that gives us a model of faithful ministry. So however it came to us, the Holy Spirit has given us a model here that we should seek to emulate. Now surely you do not want your ministry to others or ministry to you to be in vain, do you? And what a, what a terrible thing for a parent to look back after their children are grown up and to think, my ministry to my children was in vain. I did not impart things of eternal good to them. Perhaps the parent was focused on providing the best for them. But now they realize that they were so caught up in providing that they neglected nurturing them in the Lord. Oh yes, they had a fine home for them. They gave them a, a, a very fine education. Lots of experiences. But there's no godliness in their lives. Their efforts, as far as ministry is concerned, are in vain. Or maybe the focus was on making the children happy. And now the parents realize that those children have no interest in serving others sacrificially. They have no interest in serving the Lord Jesus Christ sacrificially. They only want to be entertainment. They go from one form of entertainment to another. They are empty and dead. All those years of parenting were in vain. They've got nothing to show for it. Or maybe there was rigid discipline, but there was no love for Christ. Children know how to work hard, but they have no heart for God. And what about a minister of a church? At the end of his ministry, he comes and stands before God, and he realizes that he has not imparted to anyone grace through his ministry, that he's not imparted to Christ to anyone through his ministry. He had praise for being a nice guy. He had praise for being understanding of people. Maybe praise for being diligent. Or maybe, on the other hand, he had a life of ease and felt that he had it made because he didn't have to work as much as other people. 
But now he realizes that it was all vain. It was worthless. It was useless. Maybe he labored in the word diligently, but he didn't care for the people. Had no love for them, no concern for them. Or maybe he omitted in his preaching the things that he thought might offend people, wanting to keep them happy. Maybe he never prayed. Maybe he was just a lazy slug. Could be any number of reasons. But whatever he has done, it has all been done in vain. And what about the person who is just a neighbor but has no fruit? Maybe they have sought to minister to others from time to time, but they've lived for themselves generally with no concern for anyone else. They've gone through life, gone through their career, retired, now they're ready to die. They simply did not care if other people in the church were walking with the Lord or not. It didn't really matter to them. They didn't really bother with those things. Their life was lived in vain. Maybe they've tried a little bit, but their example disrupted every effort that they made because they were such a poor example that they could never influence anyone else. What a tragedy to have labored in vain. Look now at the end of our text in verse 12 to see what the goal of ministry is. So we start at the beginning and now we're jumping down to the end and then we'll go through the middle. Verse 12, the goal of ministry is to influence others that they would walk worthy of God who calls them into his own kingdom and glory. What a lofty goal that is. To influence others so that they would live the way that those who have been called by God Almighty into his own kingdom and glory ought to live. Just think of it. We're talking about the glorious creator. The one who made all the stars and all all the galaxies. The one who made our bodies. The one who called the world into being by the word of his power. And sinners like us to even think that we might try to walk worthy of him. Yet we are able to come to live for him. We're able to come and live in his house. We're brought into eternal life, into the very family of God, to behold his glory. The glory that Jesus Christ had as the Son of God with the Father before the world was even made. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwelling together. In you. We get to behold that glory. We get to walk with him and live with him and inherit that, that house. To, to know God and to become like God is those who are made in his image. To be a true reflection of him in the way that we love, in the way that we serve, in the way that we care. An everlasting inheritance with Jesus Christ. God's call is a marvelous call. Because it is a call that doesn't just tell us what to do. But it's a call that provides for us what we need to do it. We are hopeless sinners. But God sent his son to save us. In him we are promised complete forgiveness of sins. We can't do anything to get rid of our sins, to wash away the guilt. Jesus Christ paid it all. In him we are promised also the power and grace to live a new life. The Holy Spirit is given to us to transform our lives and enable us day by day to grow in his grace and to walk in him. And again, the goal of ministry is that we would influence others to bring them in connection with this salvation. And to keep pointing them to go to Christ and go to this salvation, to walk in this calling that they have received from the Lord, to walk worthy of that calling that they have from God, even to walk worthy of God who has called them into his own kingdom and grace. Now, Do you not want to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory? Many of you love the Lord Jesus Christ, and you do want that. And don't you also want to influence other people to do that? Your children, the people around you, surely you want to do that. Well, if you're going to have a ministry that's not in vain, that bears fruit, Paul spells out what needs to characterize that ministry. Your life is one who is serving others. We'll look at these characteristics under four headings. Pray that I will have these as a minister of the gospel. And pray that you will have them as one who ministers to others in your life. The first thing that characterizes ministry that is not in vain is boldness. 
Paul speaks of this in verses 2 and 3 where he says, We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God. You're bold when God's message flows freely from you to other people. The word translated bold literally means all speech. It's a compound word in the original language. All speech. So it refers to speaking without holding anything back. Okay, you say everything that you need to say for God. You say what you need to say without trimming the message in any way whatsoever. So that nothing that needs to go, go through doesn't go through. You've met bold people like that. They, they speak for God. They know what to say in a situation. They bring home the word that needs to be spoken. For Paul and his fellow ministers, the temptation would have been strong because they had suffered and been spitefully treated at, at Philippi, the city that they had been just before they came to Thessalonica. They had been beaten. They, they, were, they were, had blood on them from, from their, probably, that was still drying, so to speak. But after that, you see, after that kind of treatment, it would have been so easy, so natural, to go to the next place with the same kind of people, and without realizing it, to make a few adjustments to the message. Not radical things, just to adjust it here and there. To take the edges off just a little bit. And of course, after that's done for a while, it completely compromises the real word of God. Like so many ministers today, they add a little bit of flattery to it. To turn the gospel, as so many do, into a social gospel. You know, this is how we can live in a pleasing way in our world, in our in our nation and among the people that we're with. To make Jesus only an example of whatever they want him to be an example of and not a savior from sin. I've recently been uh, talking to some people where I'm countering a gospel that they have received that's really another gospel. It looks at people's fundamental problem is that they are victims who have been abused in the world and they need to come to Jesus to receive comfort and to be lifted up again and told of how good they are and how they can go on and, and uh, do good things for God, rather than looking at people fundamentally, as the gospel does, as sinners who need to be saved. It is really a different gospel. It's not that there's no comfort for those who have been victims of abuse and that sort of thing in the gospel, but that's not the essence of the gospel. And those who come in that way do not come into salvation in Christ. The gospel calls for repentance. It doesn't call for coming to God to be understood. It calls for coming to God as a sinner that has sinned against him and that is condemned, who needs forgiveness and mercy. That's fundamentally what we are, sinners before a holy God. When you're rejected and abused for speaking the truth, it's easy to make a few adjustments. There's a gospel like that that goes out all across the airwaves. Many churches today, and you see, that's not faithful ministry. Faithful ministry that Paul and his companions did, the word goes without alteration. How it ruins our ministry when the pure gospel does not flow from us to others. When we distort it and pervert it and transmitting it so that something other than God's message is heard. Paul shows us, as he shows us, the message must not spring out of error. That's when you're mistaken about what the word says. You have not been careful to speak according to the word. You've slipped into error, you believe things that aren't true, and you pass those on to others. That's why we need to be diligent in God's word. The message must not spring out of uncleanness either. The second thing he mentions speaks of impurity in the motive. For example, maybe a man enjoys getting attention of women through his ministry, and he's going around, and that's really what, he, what, what keeps him going in the ministry. Or another one that wants to be famous, similar thing, or, and to impress people maybe. Maybe he wants to impress other ministers. Such a man is sure to pervert the gospel anytime it gets in the way of his goals. Oh, I'm not impressing people. What do I need to change? He's got an impure motive. He changes. It comes out of impurity rather than from springing from God himself. And the message must not be brought in deceit where you're trying to mislead people. This happens when you leave something out because you think people won't like it. So you take it upon yourself to, to cut something out that is maybe a hard truth for people to hear. 
Martin Luther pointed out that the very thing that is most offensive in the day in which we live is the thing that needs to be emphasized because that's the point where people are resisting God in your society. Whatever it is that they particularly oppose that's, that's in God's truth, that's the point of resistance. For example, today people can't bear to be told that they're not to follow their own passions. You know, whatever I feel inside of me is a good thing and I have to pursue my passions. I have to follow my, my desires. And they especially hate it if you tell them that those passions are themselves sinful. As long as people think that their hearts and passions are all good, then they're never going to see a need for Jesus Christ to save them from their sins. It doesn't go to the core of who they are. It's just a surface thing. Oh yeah, I made some mistakes, I did some bad, but inside, I'm good. That's the idea. That's, you can preach a gospel that, that overlooks and that, that, that caters to that very notion. So pray that the gospel will get through to you out of the ministry that I exercise here and out of the ministry that other ministers exercise and that you yourself convey to other people. We only wreck it when we alter it so it doesn't bring life and beauty to others. Now let's look at the second thing that characterizes effective ministry. That it is done for God. You have to realize that you're about God's business when you're ministering. Paul and his friends kept that in mind. They kept in mind that God was the one who initially approved them and who sent them into the world with the gospel. You see that in verse 4. And they also saw, as it says at the end of verse 4, that God was always evaluating their hearts. He was testing their hearts as they went about. They were there for Him. They were there doing His business. He was the one that had called them, and it was His gospel that they had been given, not theirs to do whatever they wanted with. As one fellow put it, it's sort of like being entrusted with someone else's money if you're given a task, maybe you're a purchasing agent for someone and you're supposed to go in and, and spend money to buy, make investments for them and things like that. You don't use that money however you wish. You are approved to be entrusted with that money and you're going to be tested as to how you used it. And so it is with the gospel. You don't just take the gospel like a, like a piece of clay that you can shape around however you want and, and push it this way and that way and do whatever you want with it for your own purposes. Listen, if the goal of ministry, as we have seen, is to influence others to walk worthy of God who has called us into his own kingdom and grace, how could you ever expect to influence others that way if you are not even in your own ministry intending to please God? If God is not the one that is in your purview when you're serving, if it's other people instead, your whole life has to be lived for him, not for other people. But it's so easy to forget that, isn't it? The smile of other people is easier to see than the smile of God. You can't start out aiming to, you, you can start out aiming to please Him, and then when you start to get some acclaim from other people, it feels good. So you shift the focus to pleasing people. And your own corrupt heart will tend to gravitate to pleasing people because you can deceive them. They don't examine your heart, do they? They just see what you do outside. They don't even see what you do in your own home. How do you think that so many ministries get off track and start preaching a message that denies hell and that winks at sin and that suggests other ways to come to God besides the cross? You can use a few flattering words and people will be pleased. People will always think you're quite wise and discerning person when you tell them what, what good people they are. You ever notice that? If someone's praising someone, oh, what a good, oh, this, what a good minister this is. And often you find out that because they came and told them, oh, you're such a great, you know, whatever. And, and they, they think, oh, yeah, this person's really discerning because they see how, how great I am. I like this, I like this person a lot. Um, they will declare what a great person you are, and then those people will give you money and fame and acclaim and all the other things. That kind of flattery is what Paul is talking about here, is a cloak of covetousness. See, what's really going on is covetous desires. It's not an aim to please God. It's an aim to get something from other people, a claim or whatever it is. You pretend that you're ministering, but in fact you're trying to get whatever you want from them. Think about that in your family. 
If you're for God, you'll speak to your family in accordance with what he says. And sometimes it will be hard things that you have to say. But if you're for yourself, you not say the hard things to them for fear that they won't like you. Or just because you don't want the trouble of it. A lot of trouble. You know, just leave well enough alone. Those are reasons that parents don't discipline their children. And those are reasons that churches don't discipline their members. They're not in it for God. They're in it to be liked by people or whatever, and they have very little impact for God. But this is living to please God and not men. This whole idea of living to please God and not men can go all wrong. It can be a posture that is assumed in a proud way. I'm doing this for God. I'm not, I don't care what people think. I'm doing this for God. That kind of an attitude. You've seen that before. Harsh, harshness. You've got to toe the line. You come at people like that with, with a harsh ministry. Use the rod of God in anger. You know what Proverbs says about the rod of anger? It says that it will fail. So that kind of ministry fails. And this is the next thing that Paul goes into here. You see, these are guys that are just, they're, they're frustrated individuals, and they found a pious way to unleash their frustrations. A pious pretext, that is. That's all with, it's all for zeal for God. I'm zealous for God. That's why I'm so cantankerous and hard to get along with. The third characteristic, then, of effective ministry is, is exercise in tender care like that of a nursing mother. What a picture that is. Verse 6 and 7, Paul says, Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Now he's just been showing how they were sent by the God of heaven, by Jesus Christ. They were approved by him. They were examined by him. As those sent by Christ, they might have demanded that honors be given to them to have servants serving them, to have people kissing their feet. They might have demanded fine meals and fine accommodations wherever they met, went. But how unlike Christ they would have been if they had done that. How unlike Christ are those who do that today. How unlike Christ are parents who claim that their God-given authority is a reason that they have liberty to yell at their children as giving them a right, because I'm an authority here, to be irritated with them just because they are the parents and just because they're having a hard day and they want to take it out on someone. I am always trying to get parents in our day to learn to exercise their God-given authority. But what a terrible thing it is when someone takes that authority as an ugly occasion to exercise self-centered authority. I am the head of the home and you have to do what I say. That's what Paul did not do. Indeed, he gives us a very different picture, that beautiful picture, verse 7. We were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. What's a nursing mother's goal? To nourish her child. She wants to give that child what it needs to thrive. Yes, she has full authority, full authority over that child. She didn't provide, for, the child would die. But her authority has no errors about it, does it? Have you ever seen a nursing mother with errors about this? It's, it's not the ugly kind of authority that makes her strut around with great importance as the, you know, as the one whose chief concern is to be respected by this child. I'm here to get respect from this child. That's what it's, this is all about. No, she's gentle. She's gentle toward that little child. She's there to provide it with what it needs. That's her focus and her goal. And brothers and sisters, that was Paul's goal. That was what he, he cared about, the people. He wanted them to learn to walk worthy of God. Remember the verse 12? Who called them into his own kingdom and glory. He wanted them to come and live in the fullness of the gospel. Of the calling that they had from God to be his people. He wanted them to draw on the resources that God had 
for them that would enable them to thrive in God's kingdom. There are all these resources and he wanted to give it to the people. He wanted them to drink and eat and, and have that living water that, that comes from God. He cherished them like his own children, wanting to adorn them with the riches of the gospel. He was like a nursing mother. The whole focus was on getting what the child needs. Think about it. Fathers, mothers, husbands, officers in the church I have one question I want to ask you here. Do you, in fact, cherish those who are under your care? Don't answer that too hastily. It's easy to say, oh, yes, of course, of course, they're my children. Of course I do. It's so easy to get busy running things, managing things, providing for, for the family, and to forget that we're ministering to people, people that we're supposed to love and care about. We don't even love them or care about them. They're just tools that we get irritated with when they don't do what we want the way we want. Do you need to repent of a cold, irritated heart toward those that you're supposed to be loving and caring for? Did you forget that it is God who changes them? You feed them, God changes them. As a nursing mother, you're to pour out yourself for those under your care. If you affectionately long for them, you'll want to do more than just feed them. Look at what Paul says in verse 8. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. Mother does a lot more for her babe than just nursing. She gives herself to that child in every way. Changes diapers. She washes clothes. She bathes the child. She comforts the child. Hugs the child. You know, you can preach the gospel to people, but it shouldn't end there. What does the gospel testify? The gospel testifies to us about the great love of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. And so what should a minister be doing besides telling people about that great love that is in Jesus? He should be modeling that love himself, imitating that love of Christ by giving himself for the people that he's ministering to, laying down his life for them, sacrificing for them, not getting irritated and fed up with them. So let me ask you another searching question. Because that's a hard thing to do for us as selfish sinners. And we want to tell people, but we don't want to actually lay down our lives and give of ourselves, of our souls, as he said. We gave our own soul to you. We gave our own lives to you. So let me ask you this question, another question. Do you affectionately long for people that you minister to? Are they dear to you? And here's the other part to that question. Would your children say that they are very dear to you? Would your wife say that you're very dear to her? Would the other members of the church say that they are very dear to you? See, this is painful. It stings. I told you that it stings. It's a model. And, and I don't come close to touching what Paul's talking about here. Ask him to forgive you. Pray for grace for you and especially for me as a minister of the gospel. I told you before, I've got a stricter judgment coming. Paul is able to testify. You know that this is true. His affection for the Thessalonians believers was seen. How he and his companions poured out their lives. He says, for you remember, brethren, you saw this. Our labor and our toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. He points to something they would remember. From what we can tell, Paul was a, a leather worker. We know that he made tents, and they were, they were made of leather, and we, it appears that, he, he was, that that was his trade. And when he went places, he actually taught people while he was working. So people would come, you know, little groups of people would come, as he would, and he would minister to them. There were, there were three missionaries when uh, Paul was ministering in, in this place, and and he didn't want anyone to think that they were there for money. 
Instead of receiving support from them, he worked with his hands to provide for himself and for his friends. And he received support from other churches sometimes, but he didn't receive from the ones that he had come as a missionary to minister to because he didn't want to hinder the gospel. That's one of the reasons that we have an offering box at the back instead of, of passing a plate because when we invite someone to come and hear the gospel, we don't want to put a collection plate in front of them. If people want to give, they can go to, in, in, to the offering at the back. Same thing with counseling. Don't charge fees when people come from outside who need counseling. We're here to give. We're here to minister. We're here to serve. Ministers should be willing to provide for themselves if necessary. This is what we see in the example of Paul. They should give themselves to the people in love. They should lay down their lives for them. Be willing to give of their time to labor into the night, to labor in the day for the kingdom of God. Though he does not mention it specifically here, one of the labors that Paul also gave himself to that he talks about a lot in other places is the ministry of prayer. Paul labored in prayer. So the whole driving force behind all of this is affectionate longing that the minister is to have for those to whom they minister. They love them and they want to be a blessing to them. But it's not just the love of a nursing mother that should be evident. The fourth characteristic of effective ministry is that it is done with the integrity and forcefulness of a devoted father. Paul appeals once again to what they saw of integrity in him and his team. Verse 10, your witnesses and God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Now to behave devoutly, that's a religious word. It means that they behaved religiously toward God. They live religiously in conformity to God as those who are serving God. So, you know, a father that doesn't go to church or read the word is not devout. He can't say, I behaved devoutly before you. He was not religiously doing what he should do. And then to behave justly, that next word, means that they were fair and righteous in their dealings with other people. They conformed to God's moral law in their business dealings, for example. They didn't do stuff that, like cheating people, charging fees or hiding defects of things that, that they had done. A father who hides the defects in something he's selling undermines any effective ministry he might have to his children. There he is cheating on his taxes, telling his children that they should serve God. It doesn't go. And that brings us to the next thing which summarizes these two, the two things we just saw, that they behaved blamelessly. It's more of a general statement. People accused them. People pointed a lot of fingers at Paul and his companions, but there was no finger that could justly be pointed at them. They were blameless. No one should be chosen to serve as a minister or an elder or a deacon unless they have a blameless life. All of us, though, ought to be blameless. Our ministry to others is hindered by bad examples. Matthew Poole says, the evil example of ministers often spoils the success of their ministry. Is there pride? Is there selfishness? Gossip? Lying? Cheating? Greed? Whining? Self-pity? Unjust anger? Sexual impurity, excess in eating, drinking, ungodly family, lack of self-control. All of these things can spoil a ministry. A father who loves his children will live in integrity before him. His example matters and he knows it. And besides this, he will use the second thing, his fatherly authority, to draw others to live for God. You know, sometimes fathers and ministers don't realize how much authority they actually have. God gives them a certain kind of authority and an influence upon other people. And the reason they don't realize that is because they don't want to realize that. Because it's very scary to think that what you do influences other people in a lot more ways than you think. Say, so, well, I just ran away from my family and I went out and wandered around on my own. That speaks volumes to your family. It speaks volumes to them. You, whatever you do speaks volumes. You see, we need to be very careful about how we live then. Fathers who uh, have an influence on those under their care can use that influence to lead them to live lives worthy of God the way Paul does. Look at verse 11 and 12. 
you know how we exhorted, see this is an authoritative thing, and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Parents, officers in the church, what a grand thing it is that you can influence others to live for God. This exhorting, comforting, and charging is the sort of thing that a father does, say, with his son when he's got to walk a long distance, when the family's going on a long walk, and the kid gets tired, you know, the seven-year-old gets weary, and he says, you know, come on, you just got a little bit longer to go. And he, he presses, he uses authority to get that kid to go on and do what he's called to do. Exhorting refers to coming up to that one to urge him to walk worthy of God, in this case, who has called him, to do what he's been given to do from God, to stay at it and to not give way to the flesh. It involves showing how important it is to serve God, how good and right it is, how nothing else will do. It's the Lord who has called us, and we dare not ignore him who has done so much for us. Comforting involves the encouragement to keep on in the hard times. It has to do with reminding the one you minister to that God is with them and that His grace will establish them to do the will of God. That though they are not sufficient in themselves, though you don't have strength in yourself, that God will give you the strength that you need. He is at work in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. What a comforting thing it is for a father to say that to his children. To say, I draw on the strength of God. That's how I can love my enemies and how I can serve those who do wrong for me or whatever it is. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. Do you know that power? Can you convey that in a comforting way to those that you minister to? In charging, this is the strongest of these three terms. This is where a father resorts to discipline to impress upon his son the importance of walking worthy of God. Within the church, the Lord has given us rebukes and suspension from the Lord's table, and even expulsion from the church when it is necessary. The message must be loud and clear to all that if anyone refuses to walk worthy of the Lord, I didn't say they simply come short and stumble along, but if they refuse to walk worthy of the Lord, then it will not be tolerated here. Within the home, there is also rebuke, and there is also a family can Members in the family can actually use church discipline as well. If they go to a sibling and they do not hear, then they can go and take that before someone else, someone else in the church with them and then take it before the elders. It's a ministry to them to reclaim them if possible. Everything should be about striving to see others walk worthy of the Lord and using whatever means are necessary to bring that about. And parents are given in the home the rod of discipline. And they can withhold privileges to enforce the fact that deviation from God's calling will not be tolerated in this home. It is not acceptable. But remember the nursing mother. The authority is never to be used without the love and tenderness of the nursing mother. True care for the one who is receiving it. And so you see really the point is here we don't shift from one of these four characteristics to another one. But we have to exercise all four of these at the same time in a godly ministry. Effective ministry does not use one and then the other, but all of them together with the goal to see those ministered to doing what? Walking worthy of God who has called them into his own kingdom and glory. If you're the one ministering, then you must bring God's message boldly fully without any alteration. You must bring it with an eye to pleasing God, not other people. You're doing what you're doing for God. You must bring it as a nursing mother with the care of a nursing mother, with affection for those under your care. And you must bring it with the integrity and authority of a faithful father who is earnest about impressing upon those that he ministers to the importance of walking worthy with God, of God. This is a model for ministry that we're given here. It's a great challenge for us. As I told you at the beginning, it stings to look at a model because it shows us how we come up short. But it is also very encouraging because we have set before us the pattern of what we need to strive to be by God's grace. 
As I said in the section about the Father comforting, we have the grace of God at work in us, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to help us and enable us to turn from our own way and to walk worthy of the Lord. Please stand and let's ask him. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you once again, having looked at another model of what we're called to be, we come once again not knowing whether to praise you with thanksgiving or to ask you for forgiveness and mercy. And so, Father, we come doing both. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Not been the kind of minister, not been the kind of parents, not been the kind of peers and siblings that we ought to be. And we pray, Lord, that you would have mercy upon us. We thank you for the promise that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. And we come to you, Lord, looking to you to do just that. Lord, not only that you would pardon our sin, but also that you would change us. Father, this is a beautiful picture of what we ought to be. It's something that is very, very rare in this world. And we pray, Lord, that you would raise up a whole army of ministers that would be like what we have read about here. Father, what a grand and glorious thing that would be. We pray, Lord, that you would do that by your grace, that your gospel might go forth with power in the world. We pray that you would raise up godly mothers and fathers that would also live this way, and godly people that would minister to others, that would care about the people around them, that would care about the kingdom of God, that would realize that their life is for you and your kingdom and not for themselves to be spent in a selfish, vain way. Father, thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you for the promise. Thank you that when we get to glory, that we will see a home where these things are perfectly lived out and that the most marvelous thing of all is that we will actually be an active part of that home, that we will actually be doing these things. And Father, we pray that as we look toward that hope, that we would more and more purify ourselves to become like our Lord Jesus Christ, the minister of ministers. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.